Thank you, Stephen. This meeting is being recorded. Distinguished guest speakers, His Excellency, the High Commissioner of India to Canada, Sanjay Kumar Verma, Mr. Christian Deroche, Head of the India Pacific Strategy Secretariat at Global Affairs Canada, esteemed ICFC Board of Directors, honorable guests, and dear friends. Good evening and welcome to the India-Canada Friendship Circle. We respectfully acknowledge that the lands on which we are gathered are part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anish Anishinaabeg people. This month of June is recognized as National Indigenous History Month in Canada. <clears throat> For those of you joining us from other regions, we encourage you to learn about the local traditions, history, culture, and the land of Indigenous nations in your respective communities as we recognize and celebrate this special month. <coughs> and Stephen, I'm just checking the speaker view. See the audience. And I see Dr. Naomi. Hi, okay. Our thoughts also go out to those who have been forced from their homes, from the wildfires um, that are spreading across Nova Scotia and, and Quebec. And uh, these have reached residential areas. Um, in the news over the last uh, few days, I'm sure we've all seen uh, and have learned over 400 wildfires are burning across Canada from British Columbia through the north all the way to Nova Scotia. As we all experience this smoky haze over uh, the Ottawa Valley um, and, and these wildfires that seem to have been dubbed as Canada's worst ever wildfire season, let us hope for the best and hope that Mother Nature will be kind to us. Um, mm -hmm. As Canadians, we all love nature and the beauty of uh, Canada's environment. And uh, I know it was very sad and painful to see those beautiful trees burning. So, uh, so our, our thoughts and hearts go out to those affected and, and all of us here at home. Uh, for those of you who may be new to this forum, the India-Canada Friendship Circle, also known as ICFC, it was established in 2004 as a nonprofit, non-religious, non-political organization. It aims to educate and promote dialogue through prominent experts in a variety of fields of interest to Canada and India. My name is Ruhi Ahmed. I'm president of ICFC, and it is my privilege to bring you greetings on behalf of the board of directors. The technical portion of this evening's event is being managed by Dr. Stephen Desjardins, Vice President of ICFC. I would also like to take um, a moment to make a few announcements for, uh, for our ICFC members since it's been a while um, since we all uh, you know, met up uh, for an event. And um, Firstly, I'd like to take a moment to introduce a new member of our board, Mr. Melvin Sylvester Francis. He comes to us with a wealth of experience in the private sector, including over 12 years of advertising and production of digital, print, and broadcast assets of international firms across the retail, fashion, telecoms, sports, and consumer durable in industries. Currently, Melvin is managing national campaigns for clients of General Motors of Canada. So Melvin, we are uh, very happy you could join us. Welcome aboard. And we are enthusiastically looking uh, forward to working with you. While yeah. we... Hi, Melvin. Yeah, thanks, Rui, for the lovely introduction. I'm really honored to be part of ICFC and, uh, and honored to be to do some exciting work going forward. Thank you, Melvin. Likewise. While we miss seeing everyone here in person at our pre-pandemic lectures over tea and snacks, 
We have recently received feedback from our members that they're ready to return to in-person events. So our board of directors are looking into options for face-to-face -face meetings beginning in the fall for our lecture series then. Now, given the recent patterns of natural disasters, whether they be hurricanes, floods, or wildfires, we thought our next lecture um, would feature the environment. And we've invited experts and a senior scientist from Natural Resources Canada who will present to us his research um, from his research visit to India on landslides. So that should be really interesting and stay tuned for more information on that. Now, we would like to remind everyone that this event is being recorded live. Um, the benefits of having a virtual meeting is that anyone can join us across time zones. Uh, but unfortunately, we are limited in seeing who's in the audience. So just to give our panelists, um, our guest speakers and the moderator, uh, an idea of who's in the audience, I'd like to take just about 40 seconds or so for anyone from the audience who might like to say a quick hello to unmute your microphone and please tell us your name and where you're calling from. So just jump in, don't be shy, we're a friendship circle. <laughs> Who'd like to go okay, first? Okay, so maybe the maybe the first one. Uh, I'm a Professor Chancellor Professor Vinod Kumar from Carlton University Sports School of Business, and I'm very glad to attend this particular event, especially welcoming uh, our High Commission, Honor High Commission. I'm very eager to listen to the views of the both speakers. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Uh, who would like to go next? Okay, André Laliberté. I'm very delighted to join you again because I remember the last lecture by my colleague Gopika Solanki. Yes. It was really wonderful. So mm -hmm. I'm really, really pleased to see that it's coming back. I'm a professor at the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. I'm a close colleague also of NIPA. And uh, we're working together on a chapter about relations between Canada and India. And uh, we are part of a network on the Asian studies for the Center of International Political Studies. So good evening, everyone. Oh, that's, that's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. La Liberté, and uh, welcome to the ICFC. Um, and uh, who's next? <laughs> um, good evening. Good morning. Let me see if I can. Uh, um, Yes, Rashmi? Yeah, oh, oh, can you hear me, Ruhi? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Rashmi Sharma. I'm, of course, resident in Ottawa, but presently in Vietnam, so joining you from a bit far away. Uh, very sad to hear about these dreadful uh, smoke fires, and they, it's certainly making the headlines all over the world. and. Uh, people are deeply sympathetic knowing our record for our parks and caring for our environment in Canada. Looking forward very much to this event. It's a great initiative and uh, a terrific way to start off the series in 2023. So bravo, Ruhi. Thank you, Rashmi, for joining us from Vietnam. Uh, very apropos since we're talking about the Indo-Pacific today. Look forward to hearing from you during the Q&A. Um, anyone else would like to jump in before we move on? Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, um, you know, maybe I can just quickly uh, um, identify a few people. I think Michael Wolf, are you online? Yeah. Um, so yes, <laughs> thank you, Michael. So we do have a few colleagues uh, who are experts on India from um, uh, Michael Wolf, uh, Zulfi Sadik, um, and I know we have uh, Nan Tendon and Professor uh, Prabir Nayogi from Carleton University. Actually, they both documented a history of Indo Canadians in Ottawa, so that was presented uh, at ICFC. I see Dr. Nayogi, you have your hand up. Uh, Ruhi, I uh, see that uh, Dr. Veena Rawat is in the audience. Maybe she would introduce herself. Yes, 
Dr. Rawat is our esteemed board member. Dr. Rawat, from, are you based in Washington? Would you like to say hello? Okay, um, perhaps there is technical difficulty there. Dr. Rawat uh, is uh, uh, an esteemed member and uh, receiver of the Governor General's Award and um, uh, Order of Canada. We're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Rawat as a member of our board. Uh, Rekha Dobra um, from the Indo-Canadian Community Centre, uh, Vice President. Um, I think you want to talk about your youth scholarships program. We'll do that at the end. Uh, Ken Talwar, president of the ICCC, will join us later. Gautam Subra, our former board member uh, of ICFC. Um, I see Dr. Palmer at University of Victoria has joined us. Dr. Kareem Kareem at uh, Carleton, who is also a former moderator here at ICFC on the uh, syncretic influences in India. Uh, so those are a few of uh, the people in our uh, audience. Um, uh, that should give a, a good idea, I think, to our panelists. And uh, for whomever we may have missed, we look forward to hearing you, from you during Q&A. Rui? Yes? Can you Hi, hear me? Dr. Robert. <laughs> Thank Sorry, you. Sorry. Uh, I'm embarrassed to have technical difficulties here. But uh, Prabir and everyone on this uh, in the audience. I am so thrilled to be able to see you folks and to be able to hear from you. Uh, all the best to everyone and hope these uh, fires go away because you won't believe the haze in Washington and everyone is uh, wearing masks around here. So anyway, all the best to everyone and to Surendra and I are keeping well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rawat, and uh, uh, stay safe. Um, so I think now um, perhaps we can turn to our panel. Uh, it is actually my pleasure to welcome you all to our first spring lecture of this year to examine Canada's and India's strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific. The moderator, uh, Dr. Nipa Banerjee, will introduce today's panel in which we will learn more about the Indian and Canadian government's approach to the Indo-Pacific including security, economics, social, and environmental priorities. The emergence of the Indo-Pacific, bringing together the Indian and the Pacific Oceans, represents the new strategic reality of the 21st century. The Indo-Pacific is the world's fastest growing economic region and accounts for 65% of the global population. The rise of China across the Indian and Pacific Oceans and new challenges to the post-World War II and Cold War security umbrella has also been a focus of many policy experts and academic commentaries. Canada's future will be tied to the Indo-Pacific for decades to come, given the growing impact of this region on Canada and the world. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nipa Banerjee, who is a board member of ICFC and the moderator of today's panel. Dr. Banerjee has a career of 34 years with the Canadian International Development Agency, which was amalgamated with Global Affairs Canada. As the Canadian Government Aid Representative, Dr. Banerjee has had postings to nine countries in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. She was also the Canadian government representative as counselor development at the Canadian High Commission in New Delhi. Currently, she is a professional in residence at the University of Ottawa and principal researcher at the Centre for International Policy Studies in the University of Ottawa Faculty of Social Sciences. Dr. Ben Dr. Benerjee, we are pleased you could be here today. I turn the floor over to you to introduce the topic and our panel. Okay. Um, can you see me still? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ruhi and Steve. Uh, phenomenal changes have um, marked global economic geography. Uh, the financial center of gravity shifted after the Industrial Revolution, first to Europe, then to America, and then swiftly moved towards Asia. In the 1960s, the East Asian tigers 
took the lead in this economic reversal. Two Asian giants, India and China, embarking on rapid industrialization, then took up the trend set by the East Asian tigers. Since the early 1990s, Asia has consistently outperformed Europe and America in economic growth. The continent's global gross domestic product, GDP, and trade share have risen remarkably, and Asia has become highly integrated with advanced economies through complex global value chains. The India-Pacific region is opening up new horizons of opportunities. Our topic of discussion this evening is how Canada and India are responding to the Indo-Pacific region's global importance. What does it all entail for India and Canada? For Canada, the Indo-Pacific region would play a critical role in shaping Canada's future. Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, launched in November 2022, seeks to deepen ties with a fast-growing Indo-Pacific region of 40 countries, accounting for nearly Canadian $50 trillion in economic activities. The strategy is expected to position Canada for long-term growth and prosperity that benefit all Canadians by enhancing and diversifying Canada's economic relationships with the vital Indo-Pacific economies, such as India, a country whose growing strategic economic and demographic importance in the Indo-Pacific makes it a critical partner for Canada. We are honored to have this evening as speakers, Excellency Sanjay Kumar Verma, the High Commissioner of India to Canada, and Mr. Christian Deroche, Head of the India-Pacific Strategy Secretariat at Global Affairs Canada. They will present their analysis and perspectives of the region, their country's strategic interest in the region, and how to address these interests. Our first speaker, Mr. Christian Deroche of Global Affairs Canada, will give the audience a comprehensive picture of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. His Excellency High Commissioner of India to Canada, Sanjay Kumar Verma, will then present his perspectives on India's strategy, strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific and its key regional objectives. Following the presentations by our guest speakers, the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions and offer brief comments before our session ends. I introduce our first speaker, Mr. Christian Deroche, head of the Indo-Pacific Indo Strategy Secretariat in Global Affairs Canada. Mr. Deroche has had a distinguished career with the Canadian government. He served at the Foreign and Defence Policy Secretariat of the Privy Council Office as the lead Asia advisor. As a Foreign Service officer, he had assignments in New Zealand, Nigeria, and Afghanistan. At the Global Affairs Canada headquarter in Ottawa, he was the Deputy Director for Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC. He served as a Senior Advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He has been responsible for various interesting files, such as the G7, the UN Sustainable Development, and National Security Issues. I turn to Christian now to make his presentation. Christian, our professional exchanges go back several years, almost 15 years, on issues related to Canada's foreign policy aid foreign policy, aid policy to be precise. I look forward to learning from you now about Canada's strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific region and the plans of action Canada proposes to achieve these. Please take the stage, Christian. Thank you very much, uh, Nipa, for the kind introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 
Okay. So um, it was, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I'm always excited uh, to have the opportunity to discuss Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, very uh, pleased to be here with a distinguished group of, uh, of Canadians to talk about an important uh, uh, government strategy, also important relationship with India and, and other countries in the region. Um, I, earlier today, I'm also uh, delighted to be here with uh, His Excellency, the High Commissioner. Incidentally, our own High Commissioner to India, uh, uh, Cameron McKay, is in town this week because we have this global heads of mission meeting. So all of our High Commissioners, ambassadors uh, from around the world are here. They met with Prime Minister Trudeau yesterday. And so I had a good chance to meet uh, with um, High Commissioner McKay, and he sends his warm regards uh, to you as well. Um, so my role as the head of the Indo-Pacific Strategy Secretariat is, uh, as, um, as Dr. Banerjee noted, we, we launched a strategy in uh, November last year, six months ago, and we are driving uh, a very ambitious agenda to realign uh, the uh, focus of the Government of Canada, not just Global Affairs Canada, to pay greater attention to a, a region that is of increasing economic uh, importance, strategic importance to Canada. And so we have a number of, uh, of tools and new resources to make that happen. And so I have a presentation today that will provide a bit of information on this. I, I should just preface my uh, pre presentation by saying that, uh, as you heard from my brief uh, bio, I'm not an India expert. I'm uh, My role here is to work on, on the regional team, although I do know uh, quite a bit about India. In my previous role at the Privy Council Office, I was advising the Prime Minister on India, and I was very uh, honored to uh, facilitate the meeting between Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Modi uh, on the margins of the G7 summit in Germany in 2022. It was their first meeting since uh, 2018, and so uh, a lot of good things have been happening in Canada. India relations since then, and I think that the Indo-Pacific strategy is going to position us to, to do even more. Um, so obviously, uh, I've uh, in discussions with Ruhi, uh, Stephen, uh, and Nipa, we, we've agreed that the presentation today would be in English. Obviously, uh, if there are any questions or comments uh, en français, uh, il me fera plaisir de répondre. Et la, la présentation sera aussi disponible en français uh, si vous uh, voulez obtenir une copie. Um, so I have a PowerPoint presentation, and Stephen, I believe, was uh, going to try to uh, post it. Let's see if it works. Perfect, thank you very much. So I'm not gonna bore you with too many details, but I, there are a few maps, graphics, and visuals here uh, to basically help you um, uh, follow uh, follow along. I just uh, note that uh, I'm, I was very pleased to hear that you're gonna be organizing uh, in-person meetings again uh, uh, in the future. I think uh, some we've been doing more of that here as well. And I would have hoped that maybe next time I can stop by. I live very close to the India High Commission. So maybe I could have stopped by for tea with the, with the High Commissioner, but maybe for next time. So uh, here, uh, the presentation. Uh, and uh, of course, I'll be very happy to hear your comments and questions at the end, uh, obviously, because uh, I'm, uh, we, we are always interested in hearing feedback from, uh, from Canadians who are interested in what we do. Um, so Canada's Indo-Pacific Strategy, we can jump to the next slide, uh, Stephen, if, uh, if we can. So this is a map that basically uh, explains why the region is important. And, and, and Nipa gave us a, a few highlights, as, as well as Ruhi. I mean, 50% of the world's GDP by 2040 will be in the region, uh, an increasing uh, part of the global population. Uh, we, uh, but there also, there's also poverty in the region, so we, our development assistance um, uh, efforts need to focus in the region as well, even though it, does, it is becoming increasingly prosperous. And also 50% percent of global greenhouse gas emissions are in the Indo-Pacific region. So if we all uh, care about uh, climate change and the fight to, to contain uh, and reverse a climate change, we are going to have to work very closely in the region. So the Indo-Pacific strategy is really a recognition that this region is becoming increasingly important for Canada, but perhaps that our investments uh, have not kept pace with the, the region's growing importance. And so this strategy is partly an attempt to give the government of Canada and our partners in provinces, territories, and other levels of government the tools to be able to make uh, Canada more effective in the region. I would also note there's an important statistics here, a statistic here that one of five Canadians have family ties in the region. That includes, I, I believe, 1.8 million Canadians of, of Indian uh, descent, which is is a, a, a very important opportunity for us to uh, deepen our ties in, in the region. Um, 
Next slide. Okay, so uh, as, as was noted, the strategy was announced, and I guess the big headline item is, this is a 10-year strategy, but it's $2.3 billion of funding over five years, and then with more funding uh, to follow. And so we like to say here at Global Affairs Canada that this is not just a Global Affairs Canada strategy, it's a whole of government strategy. There are 15 government departments that are involved along with Global Affairs in the implementation of the strategy, along with all of our provinces and territories. I meet with them every two weeks um, uh, to, to, to coordinate our engagement. Um, and we're, we're talking here about new programs and initiatives that I'll be highlighting in some of the next few slides, but also uh, just to give you an idea of the magnitude, uh, with the Indo-Pacific strategy, we will be creating 350 new positions across the government of Canada, just focused on the Indo-Pacific region. And this, I think, was an important decision. We're at a time where, you know, the economy is starting to show signs of, uh, of strain and the government is starting to, to take steps to kind of restrain spending, but they felt it was important for us to be able to uh, increase our, our uh, uh, our footprint in the region. So these are not just Global Affairs Canada positions. There's going to be Natural Resources Canada, Agriculture Canada, uh, some of our security agencies. And th this is really um, uh, a whole of government strategy because we understand that for Canada to be effective in the region, yes, we want to deepen our trade and economic footprint, but we also need to be to show that we're pulling our weight and we're contributing to uh, promoting peace and security in the region. So there are investments in defense and security. We're also uh, pro doing more to uh, invest in our capacity to process visas so we can sustain those people to people ties. Uh, there are some investments uh, to help address infrastructure gaps in the region and sustainability and so on. So it's really a comprehensive whole of government approach. And it's really what we call a generational strategy. We haven't had a big strategy like this for for many years and uh, this along with this future of diplomacy initiative that our uh, minister Jolie, our foreign minister, uh, uh, recently announced and spoke about uh, yesterday are really two of the main platforms that are going to guide uh, our engagement uh, in the Indo-Pacific and beyond uh, for many years. Next slide. So here, um, the Indo-Pacific strategy, it's about engaging in the region, but it's also about priority relationships. And here, of course, uh, India is, is a key priority in the strategy, uh, an important strategic partner. Uh, you can't have Indo-Pacific without India. And the Indo-Pacific concept, which was developed originally by Japan, is, is really an attempt to bring India into the region uh, to help promote the values that we care about, democracy, uh, pluralism, the rule of law. We share these these, prior, uh, the, these interests with India, and we feel that uh, you know, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of value in working closely with India, Japan, and other like-minded countries to make sure that uh, you know, all countries in the region abide by these, these rules and norms. Uh, so so uh, obviously, Obviously, our interest in deepening relations with India is based on several things. There's a trade and investment pillar uh, that, that's important. And Minister Goyal, India's uh, uh, commerce minister, was here recently on, on a visit. My colleague Michael, who's on the line, could tell you about a very, a very successful visit, uh, which included uh, a, a dialogue on uh, a potential, uh, potentially uh, an early harvest trade agreement uh, between uh, uh, Canada and India. Uh, there's uh, an interest in encouraging people to people exchanges. Uh, India is now the uh, biggest source of foreign students in Canada and our, our universities are interested in, in continuing to increase those numbers. But also, uh, you know, we have an ongoing dialogue on security, democracy, the environment. We signed an environment MOU with India last year and we're looking forward to doing more with India in, in the region. So, um, just in terms of the economic weight, uh, it was already noted, but uh, the latest projections are that India is going to be responsible for 15% of global growth over the coming decades. And that's huge. As a growing middle class, there's a growing opportunity for Canadian uh, exporters and investors. And uh, you, I think uh, many people on the line here today will know that Canadian pension funds are already, uh, uh, you know, have a big, big presence in India and are looking to do more as well. So India, uh, a key partner, and just to give you a sense of, of how much has been going on. Obviously, the fact that India is hosting the G20 this year is an important factor because ministers will, will be traveling to the region. And we've had uh, already a lot of ministerial, ministerial travel to India uh, this year, including uh, Minister Jali, our foreign minister, has been there twice. 
uh, once for a bilateral visit in which she had a strategic dialogue with uh, her, her uh, counterpart, uh, Minister Jai Shankar, and she was there also for the G20 foreign ministers meeting, and we expect many other ministers will be going there this year, culminating with uh, the, you know, the G20 uh, summit of, of leaders uh, in September, which we, we expect Prime Minister Trudeau will, will attend. So there's a lot going on, and this, this year is a great platform for us to, to uh, uh, put the strategy in action this, uh, with India. Thank you for, oh, next slide is fine, China. So uh, those of you who follow the news will see that uh, our relationship with China has been somewhat complex in recent uh, months and years, um, obviously. And the, the strategy has had some pretty firm messages regarding China. There has been a change of tone. Uh, you know, uh, our minister, foreign minister described uh, uh, China's increasingly disruptive global power. Uh, of course, the word disruptive has several connotations. Uh, we like to say that the iPhone was very disruptive as well. Before 2007, BlackBerry, a Canadian company, had two-thirds of a global market share in smartphones, and then the iPhone arrived, disrupted the market, and now they're the dominant one. So disruptive is not necessarily only negative, but there are things that uh, China is doing uh, in the region uh, that are of concern to Canada and like-minded partners partners, including India, and we feel that it's important for us to work together to uphold um, the rules of, and norms that have allowed uh, the region to prosper. Uh, that being said, we, we understand that uh, Canada and other countries will continue to need working with China. China is a huge market. Canadian companies are heavily engaged there. Uh, if we want to make progress on the fight against climate change, we need to work with China. And I think one a good example of our, uh, our ability and our willingness to continue working with China is that only two years, uh, two months, weeks, sorry, after the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy was announced, Canada hosted the COP15 biodiversity conference in Montreal. It was actually under China's presidency. China was supposed to host a meeting in Kunming, China, but because of its COVID restrictions could not host a meeting. And so because Montreal is um, uh, host the Secretariat of the Biodiversity uh, Convention, we agreed to partner with China on hosting the meeting. So we can, we will continue working with China when it, we're interests align, but there's a greater willingness to basically challenge China in areas where we have uh, profound disagreements. Uh, next slide, Stephen. So another uh, area that's of uh, interest to Canada in the Indo-Pacific strategy is what we call the North Pacific. I would note particularly Japan and South Korea uh, that are leading economies there and very close uh, democratic partners of Canada. Uh, needless to say, both uh, Japan and Korea uh, are very interested in Canada's energy, uh, Canada's en uh, critical minerals, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, ministerial travel uh, there. Um, Japan recently hosted the G7 uh, summit in Hiroshima. Prime Minister Trudeau was there, but there were also several ministers who have been uh, through our natural resources. Minister Wilkinson was there earlier this year. Minister Champagne, our Minister of Innovation uh, and Industry, uh, has been there a few times recently and so on. So that obviously we will continue partnering very closely uh, with them. And I would just note for South Korea, the Prime Minister was recently there uh, on a bilateral visit. And uh, this just goes, goes to show when I was at the Privy Council office, uh, pre the new South Korean president who was elected, President Yoon, was elected on a, an anti-feminist platform, which, uh, you know, we were wondering whether they would be able to build a good rapport with Prime Minister Trudeau, who has very strong views in favor of, of gender equality. And in the end, uh, they met, they first met together on the margins of a NATO summit last year in Europe. And then since then, uh, President Yoon visited Canada in September, and then uh, Prime Minister Trudeau visited South Korea, and they have a very, very strong relationship. And uh, I, I think that we will continue building on that as well. So two, two important partners in the region. Uh, next slide. ASEAN, so ASEAN it refers to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Southeast Asia is an important um, uh, region for Canada. Uh, when we talk about Indian Pacific strategy, the need to diversify our markets. So it means that in certain cases, in areas where we have uh, our markets are, are uh, dependent on China. And one good example is canola, uh, where you know we had, I think, 80% of our canola exports going to China. And then when our bilateral relationships uh, started getting, becoming complicated, uh, all of a sudden uh, they closed that market for us. Uh, you know, Canadian exporters had to scramble. And so what we're telling exporters is that, yes, keep trading with China, but if 
uh, you feel that you're becoming too dependent on that market. India is one good place to look, and ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, are uh, also an important opportunity. Uh, we're thinking here notably of, of Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Um, um, Indonesia, we are negotiating a free trade agreement with them. We're also negotiating a free trade ag agreement with ASEAN as a whole. Uh, and so we're hoping to make progress uh, on that. And Prime Minister Trudeau has been invited to attend the next, as a special guest, the next ASEAN summit, which will be hosted by Indonesia also in September. And uh, Philippines, uh, a lot of interest ministers, a leader foreign minister was there recently. And uh, only yesterday, Agriculture Canada um, announced that uh, they were opening, opening a new Indo-Pacific agriculture and agri-food office in Manila, the Philippines, which is one of the Indo-Pacific strategy initiatives. So uh, you, you, you should expect many of these initiatives to be announced uh, in various countries of the region uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and I guess I would say as well, uh, like the countries I mentioned before, India, uh, Japan, Korea are all democracies. You know, we um, and uh, you know, cooperation is 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 uh, relatively easy in that regard. Uh, ASEAN region ha is very um, diverse, right? You have uh, democracies and uh, you know, very well-run economies like Singapore uh, that are not maybe a, maybe not as the same model of democracy as Canada, but uh, and then at the other extreme, you have Myanmar, which is in the middle of a civil war. So there's a, a, a very diverse group of countries there. And so we understand the need to be pragmatic and uh, as we engage in the region to be to be effective. Um, next slide. And then maybe I would uh, mention uh, the South Pacific because uh, and that refers to obviously Australia, New Zealand, who are which are close partners of Canada, but also the Pacific Island countries. Uh, there is a commitment in the Indo-Pacific strategy for Canada to open um, a high commission in Suva, the capital of Fiji. And so that should happen, I'd say by 2025, if all goes well, but we already have a diplomatic presence there co-located with Australia. I happen to know a lot about Fiji in particular, because when I was posted to New Zealand, I'd have to travel to all these Pacific Islands islands and so I, I could they were they were worse parts of my career than having to go there it was uh, some, uh, quite pleasant but I, I would note that there's a large Indo-Fijian community as well in Fiji who uh, many uh, of, of whom have, have also also have roots in Western Canada and so we are going to be expanding our presence there yes there's an interest in trade but also um, the Pacific Islands are increasingly becoming a uh, focus of geo strategic competition uh, you know just like during World War II uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, competition for the islands. A lot of the fiercest war uh, battles in World War II in the Pacific were on some of these islands. Uh, you know, uh, right now China and uh, the U.S. are becoming increasingly interested in the region, and we want to increase our, our diplomatic and our development footprint so that we can uh, help contribute to uh, uh, peace and security efforts and development efforts in, in the region. So I think that was my last regional slide, Stephen, if you can jump to the next one. Um, and so, yes, and I, I, I didn't include a slide on Taiwan here just because I'm interest, in the interest of time, I was uh, reducing the size of, the, of, uh, of uh, my PowerPoint presentation. I just want to say that uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy also places an emphasis on deepening our already strong economic ties with Taiwan. Those of you who follow developments in the region um, uh, will have seen that uh, Taiwan is under uh, increasing pressure from China, and there have been a number of course of measures to try and uh, intimidate Taiwan and the, the uh, influence democratic process there. We obviously, we have a one China policy uh, that is not going to change, but at the same time, we uh, feel that uh, it is in Canada's interest to continue uh, supporting Taiwan in its efforts uh, to, to diversify its economy and, and build uh, partnerships uh, with other countries uh, in the region. And so we are committed to continuing to do that. There are four strategic objectives in the strategy. One is on promoting peace, resilience, and security. One is on expanding trade investment. One is on investing and connecting people. And that is like strengthening people to people ties, ties with civil society, but also development assistance. There's one on sustainability and environment. And then finally, the enabling pillar, as we call it, is one on uh, ensuring Canada is an active and engaged partner uh, to the Indo-Pacific. And that is largely about increasing our diplomatic uh, presence in the region, as I've uh, already alluded to. Uh, Stephen, next slide. 
So the, the first uh, strategic objective uh, on promoting peace, resilience, and security, uh, if you look to the right of the slide, these are some of the major initiatives that are being funded. And I forgot to mention earlier, uh, I don't want to bore anyone with some of my bureaucratic uh, government language, but today's a very important day for us because we were, uh, all these initiatives were announced six months ago, but then we had to go to the Treasury Board, which is the central agency of government, to secure funding. <coughs> to make, and we had to convince them that we had a, a plan to spend the, these funds responsibly. And today, the Treasury Board Cabinet Committee approved funding for all these initiatives. So we, uh, all of this funding is now unlocked. And these initiatives, some have already started being implemented, but are going to, the implementation is going to accelerate. In, in the coming months. So we're talking about an enhanced military presence in the region. So um, the uh, one of uh, Canada's warships, the uh, HMCS Montreal, sailed through the Indio, Indian Ocean and is making its way all the way to the, uh, made its way to the Indo Pacific and sailed through the Taiwan Strait uh, last week. And so we will be increasing our participation in, in military and defense exercises as well in the region. There's, there's some new programming to promote security partnerships and capacity building in the region. Uh, that's going to be uh, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, we're in, in, in increasing our intelligence efforts in the region. I won't go into too many details, but uh, there's, uh, there's going to be increasing uh, increased level of resources to that. And then finally, uh, there's this new program, which I think is very interesting, cybersecurity program, where we're going to be deploying, uh, a, this is a new concept, cybersecurity attaches. So cyber attaches in, our, in many of our um, uh, diplomatic missions in the region, including in Delhi, where uh, these uh, uh, these officers will be there to help build cyber awareness and build cyber capacity across the region. And this is a recognition that increasingly for our exporters uh, and for countries in the region, uh, cyber risks have grown and that we, Canada needs to step up to be able to, uh, to help uh, promote a safer cyber environment, but also help Canadian companies in the region uh, that are active in the region protect their interests. Um, next slide. So uh, on the expanded trade investment and supply chain resilience pillar, so uh, just a few of the initiatives here, I won't go into detail, but the, there are going to be new Team Canada trade missions in the region. And so this is a new program where, uh, you know, there is, there's a new team that's being set up here at Global Affairs Canada headquarters to organize three to five trade missions a year to the Indo-Pacific. This is huge. Um, so obviously we're not going back to the Chrétien era Team Canada trade missions where the prime minister is going there with premiers and, uh, you know, and uh, 2000 delegates. We're looking at something a bit smaller, uh, basically a, a, a program to help Canadian SMEs to, you know, ex export to the region, because that's the big challenge we have in Canada is that many of our, com our companies don't know how to make the plunge to the Indo-Pacific. They are looking to the U.S. market, which has been great for us, and to Europe. But those markets are really are growing at, what, 2% a year or less in the case of Europe. And so if we want Canada to be more prosperous, we need to give these companies tools to be able to go where the growth is, which is in the Indo-Pacific region. So I'm pleased to announce that two of the trade missions have already been announced. They're going to be both being going to be in October. In early October, there's going to be a first trade mission led by Minister Ng to India. And there's going to be a second trade mission to Japan in late October. And then there are going to be further uh, trade missions that are going to be announced in, uh, in the coming months. So there's a lot of excitement uh, about the, uh, this initiative. I think already 400 companies have contacted us uh, requesting to be part of it. So uh, you're, you're going to see more Canadian ministers uh, supported by Canadian companies going to the region, including in India uh, later this year. Uh, there's also going to be a Canadian trade gateway in Southeast Asia, uh, going to be in Singapore. This is going to be a new Canadian trade trade office to help promote uh, Canadian trade efforts in the region. That uh, office is likely going to be open in 2024. Uh, we're increasing and expanding our CAN export program to help Canadian companies uh, expand to the region. Uh, we're, um, as I mentioned earlier, in opening an Indo-Pacific agriculture and agri-food office. They're going to be based in Manila, but we'll be traveling across the region to help Canadian the Canadian agriculture sector and so on. So there's a lot going on here and we, we recognize that um, in many, many respects, it's not the only metric, but you know, in five years, when we look back on the first uh, few years of implementation of the Indo-Pacific strategy, we're gonna have to look at the trade pillar saying, has the Indo-Pacific strategy made Canadians more pros prosperous? And I, I think that you know, a lot of these um, initiatives will, will help us tell that story. Uh, next slide. So the, the next uh, strategic objectives on investing in and connecting people, I would just note there are uh, some new scholarship programs here to help uh, 
uh, students uh, from the region study in Canada. That program has been mostly based in Southeast Asia, but will, is now being expanded. There's some new uh, uh, bilateral aid programming that's going to be mostly focused on Southeast Asia. Uh, the, uh, there's going to be a call for proposal for Canadian civil society organizations to go to the region and share some of their knowledge and expertise. Uh, there's a new Indo-Pacific engagement initiative that my team is going to be managing, and that's basically a new pool of money to uh, those of you who are ac academics on the line will be interested in this. We now have a, a, a fairly sizable pot of money to organize track two, track 1.5 dialogues, uh, you know, um, with uh, academics across the region. And so uh, we'll be managing, I've just hired someone to help me help, come help me implement this initiative. So very excited about it. But this, this pocket of funds would also help us increase Asia competencies here across the government of Canada, uh, language training, but also uh, uh, deeper cultural knowledge to make sure that our diplomats and officers who go in the field are more effective. And there's also going to be a, a scholarship program to help uh, Canadians go and study in the region as well. So uh, that initiative is only going to be rolled out next year in 2024, but we're very excited about it and we look forward to partnering uh, with many of you on, on uh, making it happen. And then maybe the last initiative I'll, I'll mention here, because that I'm sure will be of interest to many of you, uh, there are a lot of new positions being created as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, to process visas in the region. So the strategy announced uh, more resources in Manila, uh, Bangalore, Kandahar, and Islamabad to make sure that we can meet the growing demand. You know, this is a bit of a, there's always a, sometimes a bit of a disconnect where we, we have trade commissioners across the region promoting Canada as a, a destination for investment, for education, but then some, the visas don't follow sometimes. And often it's a capacity issue. Those capacity issues were exacerbated by the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but we're now uh, making a lot of progress to address the backlog. And now uh, this funding will help uh, accelerate uh, visa processing uh, you know, for many of our missions in the region. Next slide. So this is the uh, Sustainable and Green Future Initiative. I just here would just mention uh, uh, yeah, there's going to be a shared ocean fund to help countries in the region counter illegal, uh, underreported, and unregulated fishing. Uh, and so that's our Department of Fisheries and Oceans that's rolling that out. And then there's also a huge investment here, 750 million that's being given to FinDev Canada, our uh, development finance institution, to help countries in the region meet their infrastructure needs. So they're operating at arm's length of so I can't direct them to where they spend their money, but uh, they've already uh, been in the region. Uh, they've signed an MOU with the Asia Development Bank, and we're hoping to see um, uh, those funds start to roll out very soon. And they've told us that that initial investment of 750 million, they hope that will grow to 1.5 billion in uh, uh, infrastructure investment over the next five years in the region. And so that's just a recognition that for countries in the region to be able to, to meet the needs of the growing middle class and to fight climate change, you know, there needs to be an investment in, in infrastructure and uh, sustainable infrastructure, no less. And then I think uh, the next slide, I think is just the Canada uh, as an active and engaged partner. I would just note here, basically this uplift I, I mentioned, like we are creating a lot of positions. We're hiring, we're gonna have to hire a lot of new diplomats to send abroad. We're gonna need people with uh, language skills, with regional knowledge, or for those of you who are professors, um, you know, uh, we've launched a few competitions recently here and we're gonna be launching more. So uh, we are looking at, a. a, a you know, uh, this is a new era of, of Canadian diplomatic presence in the region. Uh, I would also note here under this initiative that the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, which is based in Vancouver and also has an office in Toronto, will also be opening uh, an office in the region, uh, likely in Singapore, but, you know, to deliver programming uh, across uh, across the region. I'm wondering, if I'm, I think there's one last slide, uh, Stephen, and then maybe I'll just uh, offer a few comments. So I'm sorry this slide is is very dense, but I just want to give you a sense of everything that's going on. So since the strategy was launched in November, Prime Minister has been in the region, as I mentioned earlier, to Japan and Korea, will likely be in India later this year. I uh, understand that Minister Sejan, our International uh, Development Minister, will also be attending a G20 uh, in, uh, Development Minister's meeting uh, in the coming days. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Fre uh, Finance Freeland was there. Minister Jolie has been there twice uh, to India. Uh, also Korea, Philippines, Japan, Minister Ng has been very active in the region. And then all these other ministers who are going 
uh, to the region. So we have not seen this pace of ministerial engagement in the region in a long time. And so I think this really shows that for people like me who've been working on the Indo-Pacific region or Asia Pacific, as we may, we once called it for a long time, we've been complaining for 20 years that, uh, you know, we don't, we didn't have a strategy, we didn't have funding, we didn't have political buy-in. I think this slide just really shows to you that our ministers understand they are fully committed to implementing the strategy and uh, are, are, are investing their time and energy um, um, to deliver it. Uh, we've also had high level visits uh, from the region, including the uh, India's Minister of Trade in May. And, uh, the, and I, I guess the last point I'd make uh, on, this, um, on this slide is that uh, Minister Jolie recently appointed our special envoy for the Indo-Pacific, Ambassador Ian McKay, uh, who's currently our ambassador to Japan. So he's going to be uh, wearing um, uh, two hats uh, for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so the reason, uh, the reason Ambassador McKay was named to this uh, position is, is not necessarily because he is an ambassador to Japan, but he's actually very close to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and to her ministers. He has very strong ties to uh, the Liberal Party and is someone who's very effective. He can pick up the phone, speak to ministers, to the Prime Minister in a way that many of our ambassadors, uh, other ambassadors cannot. And so he, uh, I think the fact that he was appointed to this position, uh, it, it really reflects uh, the importance that's being uh, given to the strategy. Incidentally, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Ambassador McKay this week. He's also in town for this Global Heads of Mission meeting. Uh, we had a workshop with him earlier this week, and uh, uh, we've uh, we've shared a list of priorities for him to engage uh, with uh, con other countries uh, in the foreseeable future. And I can assure you that India is also on that list. Uh, there's a general understanding that we, we need to do uh, more with India and sustain the momentum, the very positive momentum uh, of the of the last few months. And so, uh, and we're hoping that. Some of the new tools that we've uh, we've announced um, as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy will will help us propel, uh, you know, our relations with India, but also with other country uh, countries in the region to new new heights. So I, I guess this is my attempt to give you a sense of what the Indo-Pacific strategy is about. I have a team of fifteen people here, but we're we're just working. We're focusing on delivering the regional piece, but we are supported by a very strong team. Those of you who deal with Global Affairs Canada know that we have a very strong uh, South Asia uh, team here, uh, headed by uh, Marie-Louise Hannon and her team. Uh, uh, and so they focus on the relationship with, with India and other countries. And so we work very closely with them uh, on a daily basis to, to implement these initiatives. So I, again, I'm uh, happy to engage in the discussion. I look forward to uh, His Excellency, the High Commissioner's remarks as well. So that's it for me for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, I will now turn to Excellency Mr. Verma. Um, and um, Excellency Sanjay Kumar Verma graduated from the prestigious, uh, I'll be just a second. Uh, 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 he graduated from the prestigious Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Delhi, with a postgraduate degree. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1988. He, he has a lengthy diplomatic career serving at India's Consulate General's Office in multiple countries, China, Vietnam, and Turkey. He was India's cons Consul General in Milan, Italy, he was then India's ambassador to Sudan. In New Delhi, he was an additional secretary administration at India's Ministry of External Affairs Home Office. He has been in charge of cyber diplomacy. He's passionate about information technology, artificial intelligence, cyber diplomacy, and interactive technologies guiding people-centered services using IT and facilitating small businesses and investors. Excellency, I invite you to take the stage now. Thank you very much for a very generous introduction. I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, I can hear. Great, uh, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deroche, for laying it out from the Canadian perspective. Uh, it was very informative, and I hope that I'll be able to add value to what you have presented. Uh, please accept my 
my deep uh, solidarity with all those who have been affected by the wildfire in various parts of Canada. Uh, our hearts go for them uh, uh, so that they are able to bear the blood that uh, they are facing from the nature. Let me also congratulate Canada on uh, a well articulated uh, Indo Pacific strategy, uh, which has come out, and we are very happy to see the way in which it has been restructured uh, uh, because it will lead to a better engagement with Indo Pacific region. And finally, it will also have an impact on our bilateral relations. When it comes to India, uh, we did not go for a strategy, we went for a vision, and we called it Indo Pacific vision. Uh, which started developing way back in 2007-8. Uh, uh, and thereafter, it went through various churning. And uh, in one of the Shangri-La dialogues in, in, in uh, Singapore, the Prime Minister of India came out with a policy of Sagar, that is security and growth for all in the region. And then from there, we started developing uh, a vision for Indo-Pacific, uh, which I'll deliberate upon a little later uh, in my uh, intervention. Uh, but largely it was something uh, which was an extension of our Act East policy, which had been there with India for a long time. Uh, it started with Look East policy, we went to Act East policy. And uh, uh, now it has been extended even further, and now it is Indo Pacific uh, policy. Uh, Indo Pacific, I'm sorry. This uh, in order to implement Indo-Pacific vision, we have uh, uh, developed a framework which is known as uh, IPOI, which is Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. It has seven pillars. I'll talk about it a little later uh, in my presentation. While discussing everything, I would like to remind the audience that uh, India had never been an alliance partner with any country. Uh, it had remain non-aligned and therefore it, it is still maintains its strategic autonomy uh, in the foreign policy. Uh, many of these national interests of India do converge with national interests of other democracies in the world. And we take that forward, but there would be issues where we'll differ from our international partners. Uh, and with due respect, we also expect them to differ on some of our approaches towards the world. When you look at the Indo-Pacific region, uh, India, India's vision has been shaped due to its geography. It is sitting right in the center of Indo-Pacific region, and therefore the geography becomes extremely important uh, as far as we are concerned uh, to look at various approaches to Indo-Pacific region. The historical ties that India had maintained uh, for, with, the, with, with the west of India and the east of India all of them forming uh, Indian oceans largely, but also in the Pacific. Uh, Indian seafarers have been traveling to these parts of the world for various trading purposes. And uh, we still find uh, various communities of those traders, uh, or at least their uh, reminiscences in many parts of ASEAN and in China, South Korea, and Japan. Whenever we... Uh, look at the emerging geopolitics, India being today the most populous country in the world and being the largest democracy, will always have its own approach, its own prognosis, and its own suggestions on various geopolitical dynamics. Uh, there was a time when it was largely Europe-centric, but today when we look at the world, the most of geopolitical aspects globally are centered around Indo-Pacific region. And therefore, Indo-Pacific region becomes that much more important from the geopolitical perspective as well. For the, the very first point in our vision, Indo-Pacific vision, is the maritime security. And when we look at the maritime security, first thing to be understood is that India is a historically uh, maritime country uh, for a long, long time. It had trading links, it had military links, uh, historically going centuries back, uh, uh, both on the west of India and on the east of India, uh, which are very well documented. And uh, therefore, maritime security becomes natural to India uh, when we talk of the, one of the busiest 
corridors of sea lanes, which happens to be Southeast Asia. It, it has a very strong interest in maintaining peace, stability, and security in the Indian Ocean region and extending it to uh, Pacific Ocean region as well. Uh, I'll talk about the PICs a little later, Pacific uh, 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 Island uh, countries. Uh, so therefore, our main concern in the maritime security is to keep the sea lanes open, sea lanes open as per the international commitments of all the countries in that region, which is largely the UN Convention on Law of Seas. Uh, we need to keep impressing on all the countries uh, in that region that it's extremely important for all of us to follow a particular set of uh, uh, commitments that all of us have made and therefore keep the sea lanes open for trade and other purposes uh, in that part of the world. When we look at maritime security, the very first thing which becomes important from our perspective is the Maritime Domain Awareness, MDA. How do we engage other countries in the, uh, in the MDA domain? That is only possible if we are able to have closer relationship with all the countries which form the Indo-Pacific region and then talk to their establishments on raising uh, maritime domain awareness. Uh, luckily, India has got uh, a huge network of such agreements, huge network work of such understanding with the countries in the Indo-Pacific region, and through them, we are able to uh, take it forward. At the same time, the, these, these networks which evolve, are, they also evolve through various exercises that the navies of the countries undertake. And if I look at India, uh, we ourselves host uh, a naval exercise which is known as MILAN, M-I-L-A-N, uh, and it has been going on for some time now. Uh, last, ep last episode of Mi Milan uh, was in 2022. We saw 13 countries plus India, so 14 countries, uh, joining this exercise with naval assets, submarine and frigates and all naval, naval assets. Uh, 39 countries joined with their delegations in order to understand the situation uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, and all of their, them were partners of various parts of the world. Uh, so not only specific to Indo-Pacific, but largely I would say those countries would have an interest in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, these exercises are very important for the purpose of interoperability of our assets. When we do interoperability, it is not only for the military purposes, but also when we look at the HADR uh, for, for disaster mitigation and management. All these purposes we need are uh, commands to talk to each other from an interoperability uh, principle so that they are able to get together, work together in order to uh, uh, do things which are required of them. India does participate uh, in what's one of the largest naval exercises in the region, uh, which is known as Malabar. Uh, and uh, uh, there are a lot of, lot of naval assets from all the countries participating. Uh, U.S., Japan, Australia, India largely uh, uh, do, do go in. And we do our exercises uh, simulating various, uh, uh, various environments of uh, uh, warfare or otherwise, even while a spill today is very much a part of any naval exercise. In, in order to further uh, do our, uh, take care of our maritime security, we also expanded our Coast Guards. And now Indian Coast Guards are able to uh, police uh, uh, way beyond the waters where we were doing it earlier. Uh, and Malacca Straits, etc., one will find a good cooperative uh, arrangement between the countries of Malacca Strait and India uh, to have our uh, Coast Guard ships also visiting those places uh, uh, on a mutually convenient day time. But what it is doing is, again, even on the Coast, Coast Guard basis, we are developing interoperability of our assets of the Coast Guard. Uh, they do inform each other uh, uh, according to the intelligence that they get. And there are, I'll not get into the gray, gray uh, uh, box intelligence and, and uh, uh, black box intelligences, but there are different types of inter intelligence uh, which are being exchanged amongst these uh, players uh, who tend to secure what's one of the most 
world's busiest, actually, the busiest uh, uh, strait which carries both energy, goods, and people. In order to do so, exchange of information becomes very important when you talk of any security environment. Uh, and uh, maritime security environment becomes uh, is very complicated because um, uh, much of the information is gathered from satellites above ocean, but many other intelligence would be gathered through the ocean and our own deployment there. Uh, so we we have established something known as Information Fusion Center, uh, which is a part of the global set of IFCs in Information Fusion Centers. And this is in uh, near New Delhi, in Gurgaon. Uh, this center is attended by most of the like-minded countries through their permanent representation in this center. And there, a lot of information get exchanged amongst the partners, uh, which are uh, implementable and which could be taken action upon. So uh, maritime security becomes that much more important for us. In 2019, uh, we launched a few programs uh, uh, under maritime security, uh, which is playing a big role in various other networks, which I'll talk about later, uh, uh, by protecting the Indo-Pacific region. So the four pillars which are defined in a 2019 document in India, uh, one is capacity building, but when we say capacity building in the naval context, it is also provision of military assets and military infrastructure development. Uh, so it it does combine all these efforts together and uh, uh, try to secure the region uh, uh, better than what it used to be earlier. Capacity enhancement after capacity building is another very important uh, pillar. And there are various hydrographic studies, hydrographic development and cooperation, hydrographic assistance, uh, exclusive economic zone uh, related studies, military training, technical training, all of these are part of uh, the capacity enhancement in the field of uh, the naval engagement uh, of India in that region. Constructive engagements, which basically means uh, uh, exercises, visits, uh, uh, call, calls on the port, etc. And then there are general information exchange, which are the collaborative efforts, uh, which we try to uh, engage ourselves in and take things forward. When we, when I was talking about the capacity uh, uh, building and capacity enhancement, uh, what we have to understand is that these, these are not always warlike scenario where you, you have to enhance them, but I will just mention four of them for us to understand, for us to be on the same page. One is humanitarian assistance disaster relief, HADR exercises, where you need a huge capacity building, huge capacity enhancement in order to save lives of the people. Uh, and the properties. Second one is out of area contingencies. Uh, in military terms, it is OAC. Uh, now these are becoming much and more, much and uh, uh, much more uh, difficult to handle because there could be regions where a particular navy may not have maritime domain awareness, and therefore it will have to depend on other navies in the region while deploying its own assets. So it's a very complicated scenario. Uh, but uh, OAC uh, happens to be one of the one of the challenges which all the navies in that region uh, are facing today, and certainly we are trying to uh, add value uh, to to the best of our ability. Then there is something known as MOOTW, military operations other than war. Now this is this is the scenario I was talking about. So policing also comes uh, uh, policing beyond the uh, territorial waters comes uh, in that domain. Uh, and then finally, there is something known as NEO, which is non-combatant evacuation operation. Uh, we do a lot because of the Indian diaspora uh, in all, almost all the countries in the world. And whenever there is a crisis, we have to evacuate them. Uh, most recent was Sudan, where we conducted 127 flights out of Sudan uh, in a very combat situation within Sudan. Uh, we were not using any, um, any uh, established runways. And these were heavy, heavy transport aircrafts, which went there. Some of them landed in the middle of, uh, uh, middle of the desert. And I was ambassador in Sudan, so I'll, I'm talking with some experience there. 
uh, without any lights. So they use the night vision uh, devices in order to land a heavy uh, uh, transporter to take things uh, from there. Uh, so real time in information sharing becomes that much more important. So I wanted to leave you with this thought. Uh, now, what is what are other things that we are trying to do? Maritime security is one part uh, in our vision. Uh, we have seen that in that part of the world, uh, there is a lot of economic and financial coercions, uh, which may not be uh, very apparent uh, to start with. But when you look at PICs, which the previous speaker just talked about, uh, uh, that is Pacific Island countries. If you look at some of the more vulnerable ASEAN countries, uh, there, uh, even in South Asia, we have found uh, what happened in Sri Lanka. So many of these places, what we find is that uh, uh, initially there is a benign intervention, which finally lead to an economic or financial coercion. So we need to stop that giving options to the countries uh, uh, in the region. The hegemonistic tendencies we have seen enough uh, 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 which also either directly threaten uh, various sovereign nations or groups of people, or uh, uh, they try to intimidate. So without taking any names, uh, uh, these tendencies are rampant in the region. And therefore, as per the rule of law, as per the international order, uh, collectively, we need to combat that. Collectively, we need to bring them to, uh, uh, to a halt. Uh, calling uh, the spade a spade. Uh, the maritime disputes have also been increasing in the region, uh, particularly in this in South China Sea, and that is uh, uh, that is an important part of the India's Indo-Pacific vision, uh, and therefore we need to take that forward as well. There was a talk on uh, uh, economic engagement, so. I'll just keep myself limited to a few remarks there. Uh, we are the, uh, just, just to put India where it stands in on the economic engagement side. So we are the fifth largest uh, economy by GDP today uh, in the world. Though our GDP, uh, uh, the expected GDP for the year 2023 would only be 4% of the world's total GDP, but 17% of world's growth will come from India in the year 2023. So I'm not only talking about the values today, I'm talking about a trend which you can chart for the future. And any country uh, uh, or any, any long-term engagement with the region will only be on the basis of a long-term goal, a long-term objective, and charting the, uh, the future growth and progress of the country so that uh, when one engages, one doesn't engage for a year or two, but one engages for a long, long time in that country. Our ambition is to become uh, the second largest economy by 2040, and uh, we'll try to strive for that. And we hope that we will succeed in becoming the second largest economy. Uh, we hope to become the fourth largest economy in the world in another two years' time. So all, all these are expectations, ambitions, but we'll see factually when it happens. In recent pandemic uh, environment, we saw uh, supply chain disruptions. And therefore, at the moment, we pay a lot of attention on supply chain resilience. We have a, a platform already created between Australia, Japan, and India, uh, which is a trilateral sub supply chain resilient uh, initiative. Uh, and there we are taking care of some of uh, those aspects which could become disruptive for the world in the future. Transparent trading system is very important for all those countries which follow rule of law. And uh, we would like to uh, urge the countries in the region to stick to ethical behavior uh, of their systems, trading systems, and also have transparent trading policies so that things could be taken forward from there. Value chain becomes another important issue and the global value chain has to be uh, uh, plugged into by all the countries uh, particularly in this region, because we are only discussing the region today. Regional stability becomes another very important part of our Indo-Pacific vision. And how do you achieve regional stability? You achieve regional stability through dialogue at the regional level, 
And if I look from that perspective, we have been engaged with ASEAN for a long time. Uh, we have been, uh, we started with a dialogue partner, we became a full dialogue partner, and now we have an ASEAN plus one mechanism with India. So uh, ASEAN being the central a pivot to Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region, uh, it is very important to have region-based exchanges with ASEAN, which India already has in place. Another part of Indian Ocean is the Indian Ocean Rim. We have an organization known as Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, uh, which again provides a platform for them to exchange views and take things forward from there as agreed by various players. So that is again an engagement to, uh, to promote the regional stability. Then there is something known as ASEAN Regional Forum, ARF. Now, India had been a founding member of ARF, and ARF is another place, but it is largely focused on strategic aspects of, uh, uh, of dialogues. So uh, their collective decisions are taken by the ARF members, uh, and most of the members uh, come from Indo-Pacific region. Uh, they're in ARF, uh, uh, and uh, that, that drives things possible. On the PIC front, uh, we have something known as FIPIC, and uh, uh, we host summits of FIPIC uh, with all PIC countries, and the last summit was hosted just two weeks back uh, 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 in, in PIC, one of the PIC countries. Uh, these provide us to channelize our uh, capacity building sizes with entire PIC uh, countries. And, and there we have been doing English language centers, remote health, uh, information technology centers, HADR deployments, uh, solar energy deployments. So all these things are going on in the PICs from India for almost, uh, uh, I would say about uh, 20 years by now. Solar is the new addition, which was added uh, about five years back. Uh, I was also, while I was ambassador uh, of India in Japan, uh, I was also ambassador to one of the PICs, uh, which is Republic of Marshall Island. So I've traveled to that region many times, and uh, uh, they, they have been benefited. All these are very small nations, and therefore they become very vulnerable to economic coercion, uh, uh, sometimes even military coercion. So uh, as, as like-minded partners, we'll need to keep that in mind, how to safeguard the vulnerable partners, uh, vulnerable like-minded countries in the Indo-Pacific region. And finally, Finally, on the regional uh, stability, uh, the most talked about platform, which happens to be Quad, Quadrilateral Dialogue Forum. Uh, in Quad, it is India, US, Japan, uh, and Australia. Uh, the summits uh, do happen. There are a number of uh, groups, uh, joint working group, which meet. Uh, uh, the security is one domain, but not the only domain there. Environment is a domain, climate change, that is. Uh, another domain happens to be trade, another, yet another domain <laughs> is connectivity. Uh, uh, there is domain on cyber issues, cyber security, which the previous speaker was talking about. So all these come together in order for us to look at uh, a holistic regional stability of Indo-Pacific region. Uh, now let me come to uh, IPOI. Now, the Indo-Pacific uh, Oceans Initiative of India, which is the implementable framework of what I just talked about as uh, the vision. Now, this IPOI had been developed since 2015 onwards, and uh, it came into being about four years back, uh, five years back now. Uh, what it does is, it says that we have to enhance the regional connectivity, promote maritime security, and strengthen cooperation amongst the countries in the region. Uh, while doing so, we also uh, keep in mind that this is just a framework. This is, this is a group, but a framework, and it fosters inclusivity with ASEAN being central to all the activities. So these aspects are very important. We do respect sovereignties of each country involved and adherence to international law. Uh, this has got seven pillars, implementable paper pillars. One is maritime security, uh, uh, then maritime ecology, we call it, but basically climate change, uh, but everything to do with the sea. So all these things are maritime. Uh, maritime resources, capacity building, 
disaster risk reduction and management, trade, connectivity, and maritime transport, science, technology, and academic exchanges. So these are seven pillars. Now, these seven pillars, all these seven pillars, some country in the region is a lead and working on that. So just to give you some examples, Australia is the lead for uh, maritime ecology uh, pillar. When you look at France and Indonesia together, they are doing maritime mm -hmm. resources pillar. Singapore is doing science and technology and academic. Japan is doing trade and connectivity. Uh, UK is doing maritime security. So there are different countries which have taken lead and uh, uh, India leads almost in all these verticals as co-lead uh, since it was our own initiative. So we wanted to be uh, uh, second to everyone else there uh, and uh, try to take the things forward uh, with their collaboration. So uh, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, improvement after the launch of IPOI because it provides an implementational framework uh, IPS of Canada also provides uh, very much an implementation, implementable framework, and uh, 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 it, it is it is something which Canada will contribute to the region. In most of our frameworks, it is collective. So, as I talked about the seven pillars, you will find that all these seven pillars are collective in nature, and therefore various countries will take lead in various pillars because we feel that anything to do with the Indo-Pacific region has to involve all the countries collectively. Only then we can talk of a regional policy rather than a bilateral policy, which is working in any case. So we have bilateral relations with, good bilateral relations with all the countries uh, in the region. Uh, and we also have a good approach uh, bilaterally to all the countries and the regional groupings in, the, uh, in, in that region. So we wanted it to be an Indo-Pacific regional initiative rather than coming as a bilateral initiative. So I'll stop here. And if there are any queries, I'll be glad to respond to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, um, Excellency, for this very extensive presentation. Um, and this is, this is uh, we did not have uh, full uh, Canada had released its uh, strategy, but we did not have a um, uh, very clear idea about what India's programming would be. And this has been very, very useful for us. Now, um, we don't, we wanted to uh, give enough time for our audience to ask questions. Um, but, you know, just I wanted as as a moderator's privilege to ask a few questions. I will just raise the issues, but if um, there was time after the question and answer period, then um, uh, then I would request the um, the speakers to respond to them. I mean, this 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 is only I would like to get some comments on that. These are very important, and um, the questions are. Uh, like uh, what I looked at, whatever I have been reviewing, I saw that um, um, the opposition parties, political parties in Canada, um, and also experts and think, think tanks and academics, they have been praising the strategy and saying that this is one of the most um, substantive and well-resourced um, uh, program that has that they have seen from any government in Canada. And um, and so they they but they want to know if there is an implementation plan and there would be, I suppose, an uh, implementation plan that would be um, uh, that would have to be developed. But the experts have said that this is very important that Canada develops the implementation plan as soon as possible so that all everything doesn't remain at um, the promises stage and never really delivered. So that's one issue that I'm bringing to the attention of mainly Christian, of course. Um, uh, then another thing also is the uh, what they have been, what you know, this issue about China as a disruptive force. Um, uh, Christian has 
referred to it and he explained. However, uh, you know, there is a very serious concern among many about um, the statements about China that is used and the language that is used in the um, in the strategy. Um, and, you know, is it beneficial? I wanted to ask both Christian and um, and the um, Excellency Ambassador and High Commissioner of um, India as to what their perceptions are about that. What perspectives do they have? Um, because China's relationship with China is important because it can play um, a very, very useful role for Canada and its strategy. And um, uh, what do we do about, about the position we have taken? It looks very harsh. And some people have said that it even goes to the, on the edge of um, paranoia. Um, so, um, I mean, I just wanted to bring it. This is not what I am saying. What I am saying is what I have read and rev uh, after I reviewed different experts' um, opinions. Um, and then uh, the last one is, um, uh, I think the, ambas uh, the High Commissioner has uh, referred to it a little bit on India's strategy. It is on, um, um, it is on the challenges that we will face in implementation of the strategy. And this is a question to both, however, uh, what are the great challenges and how do, do you plan to, um, uh, to address these? So if we have, these are very important issues. There are several, but you know, for the time limit, I um, did not have too many more, um, but really brought out the, the most important ones. So if this can be discussed after, uh, we open up, open it up for public discussion. Uh, so I will now invite um, uh, the president, uh, ICFC president, Ruhi Ahmed, and the vice president, uh, Stephen Dejarda, to um, conduct the Q&A and comment section. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banerjee. And, uh, uh, yes, both the presentations were quite enlightening and definitely educational as this forum uh, seeks to help raise awareness of what is important to both Canada and India. So uh, certainly a lot to digest <laughs> in both presentations. And, and what's so interesting is uh, Canada took an approach um, where we have a strategy uh, and India took an approach based on a vision that's uh, started back in uh, 2008 or, or earlier, uh, based in, in your history as well. So it's very interesting. Um, I saw Gautam Subra and Dr. Laliberte's hands up. Uh, perhaps we can start with Dr. Laliberte uh, with your question. Yes. Uh, and then also uh, Dr. Banerjee had asked her questions as well. Maybe both speakers can incorporate um, uh, you know, their views uh, on that as well, and then we'll go to, to Gautam. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the two speakers. That was a very, very enlightening and very enriching uh, presentation from both of you. So I'll, I'll be brief and direct. Um, Dr. Roche, you, you mentioned something that I've heard often before, and that's very important. Uh, I totally agree with you when you said that Canada needs to develop Asia literacy. And, and I would like to know, you know, what in particular you would like to see uh, Canadians develop in terms of India literacy. I really think it's a, something extremely important. And as myself, a professor in political science, I really, really agree with you that we desperately need to develop uh, India literacy. And my question is specifically, what aspect in particular you think we should focus on? Is it about the economy? Is it uh, encouraging people to learn language? Is it about learning more about the politics? So I would really appreciate if you could elaborate on this. And 
uh, to the, the High Commissioner, thank you very much for your very good presentation of uh, India's vision. Uh, I would like to know, in, in, in India's vision, uh, what role do you see for Canada? So it, it's a very simple question, but I think an important one, and I'm looking forward to hear uh, your response to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor La Liberté from University of Ottawa. And um, actually, shall we also just take Gotham's uh, question? Uh, because then we can package it all if, if there's a connection to the earlier questions. Sure. Thanks, Rui. So um, both the speakers were very impressive in terms of the range of programs and initiatives that they spoke about. I, I guess my question is, I'd like to know specifically in the context of Taiwan, what Canada's position is with respect to the Indo-Pacific uh, programs and initiatives, and the same for India. What's uh, India's vision or position on Taiwan, especially given some of what we hear about um, some, you know, one particular country's uh, potential aggression towards Taiwan. Thanks. Thank you, Gautam. Um, who would like to go first amongst our guest speakers? I'll defer to His Excellency uh, to give him the first uh, privilege, unless he wants me to go first, but I'm, I'm flexible. Please go ahead. Thank you, High Commissioner. Um, so uh, I'll start with uh, Professor La Liberté's comments on, on Asia literacy and India literacy. So I, I guess what we need is, and you, everyone uh, on this call will, will, will be aware that traditionally Canada you know, has been, um, you know, one author referred to the Laurentian elite, you know, the Ontario Quebec elite who are looking to Europe. And, you know, part of the problem we've had is um, that a lot of our, our focus has been on, on these traditional institutions. Uh, there's a hierarchy here. I, I used to work on APEC and you know, G7 will always get more interest and, and so on. And, uh, you know, people like me have been fighting to say, like, if you want to be effective in the region, you need to be present, you need to listen, and you need to know what you're talking about. So for us, Asia literacy, you know, there's a narrow end of it, which I would call, you know, the kinds of things that you want our trade commissioners and our diplomats to know, business intelligence, you know, where the market opportunities are. So those are important things, but I'm thinking broader language skills. Uh, obviously, it's not an issue uh, so much in India, but although there are, of course, local languages, but Canadian diplomats are among the worst in you know, a group of like-minded country in terms of uh, foreign language proficiency. I think I saw late, latest statistics that showed that in uh, our diplomatic positions in Asia, only 40% of diplomats are at level in the language they should be speaking, whether Korea or Japan. We need to invest more. We have a good foreign um, service institute here that has a strong language program, but we, we like we have trouble recruiting people to go to China and Japan because they have to do two years of language training here. So maybe we could do one year here and then one year in Taiwan for Mandarin, for instance. And so we need to think creatively about how do we recruit and retain that kind of talent. And then the, the, the other point I make on Asia competencies, and this is as a diplomat, I've fought, tried to follow this. You need to know the literature, you need to know the history, you need to know the culture to be effective. And so that is something that, uh, you know, you, we need to recruit people who are open to learning those skills or else they will not be effective. And so that's why we're going to need to work very closely with our universities and, uh, uh, and other educational partners to make sure we have access to those Asia competencies uh, to be more effective. Um, for, to Mr. Subra's point on Taiwan, so I mentioned it briefly, Canada has long had a one China policy where, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we recognize that uh, there is one legitimate China and, uh, you know, that we, we recognize the government in Beijing, but at the same time, there's this ambiguity with Taiwan. So we work very closely with Taiwan at APEC because APEC is not a, a, an organization of 21 member states or countries, but economies, uh, you know, and we have uh, lobbied very hard for Taiwan to have a place at the table in uh, multilateral organizations where there's an, uh, an imperative uh, for Taiwan to be represented. World Health Organization, International Civil Aviation Authority. I mean, you know, the fact that China has uh, an issue with Taiwan doesn't 
obscure the fact that planes are flying over Taiwan and we need to be able to work together on these things. So we have uh, been pushing for a pragmatic approach for many years. And, uh, you know, I was a diplomat at the UN, I was a diplomat at, at, at APEC, and we have long advocated for Taiwan to be able to have that space. Obviously, right now, what's going on in Taiwan uh, is very concerning. Uh, China has uh, has taken a number of course of actions, and uh, we uh, are uh, uh, working with other partners in region to call for for de-escalation. We don't think that the uh, these moves are helpful, and we we do feel that uh, the people of Taiwan who have a democratic voice should have um, the opportunity to, uh, to to govern themselves. But it's it's a sensitive issue, uh, and you know Canada on its own is not going to resolve it. But uh, for now, our, our overall strategy is to support Taiwan's right to engage in international organizations and uh, support its right to express itself democratically without challenging our one China principle. Um, just super quickly on uh, Nipa's comments. Uh, I, th I think you're right that there's a bipartisan approach to engaging more in the Indo-Pacific. And th that's why as officials, when we plan investments long-term, we often have to think, oh, well, if there's a change of government, are we gonna be ramping back, uh, ramping, uh, clawing back at these programs? We don't see that. We, we understand that there's a strong agreement, not just at the federal level, but I talk to provinces, territories, municipalities, they're all pushing us to do more in the region. So this is something that's here to stay. In terms of our uh, concerns about China's uh, our China policies, I, I think that uh, you know we are hearing their, these concerns from certain stakeholders. But at the same time, as as a national government, you know these issues of foreign interference, uh, these issues of economic coercion, uh, the two Michael situation, uh, it, it just. It, I think show that uh, you know you have to defend your interests, or else you know no one else will do it for you. I I forgot to mention earlier, my wife complained that the photo I sent you for to put on this event poster made me look very angry, and uh, I'm usually not an angry person. But uh, you know sometimes when you uh, are defending your country's interests, you need to make sure that the other country understands what your red lines are. And so what, that's what we're doing with the Indo-Pacific strategy. China, we will work with you on issues of common interest and we're prepared to do so, but there are certain lines that should not be crossed and we, we want to be very clear with them. Last point on implementation plan, fully agree. Uh, I mean, the, the reason I, we have to work on this 550 page treasury board submission that includes a 45 page results framework is we understand we're accountable to Canadians. All this money we're spending in the region, we need to be able to show that it benefits the Canadian economy, Canadian society in five years. And so we are, are we have a relentless focus on implementation. We have a deputy minister level committee, an assist, assistant deputy minister level committee. We are monitoring implementation, uh, uh, you know, several times a year, and we'll be uh, correct, uh, correct uh, uh, course correcting as needed. But we we understand that uh, for this strategy to be successful, we need to be able to deliver and and, and show results after after five years. That's it for me for now. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Uh, so first, let me go on India's position Taiwan. It's same principle of one China uh, on the basis of which we have a uh, full diplomatic relationship with the uh, People's Republic of China. And uh, Taiwan is uh, taken as a territory uh, 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 there we don't have any diplomatic representation. Uh, there is an office which have been uh, set up in Taiwan to take care of India's consular needs and also to take care of India's cultural and trade needs. So these three are the main issues which are tackled through that office. Uh, it is known as uh, India Taipei Association. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is uh, technically it's a friendship group uh, which has been empowered to deliver these services to Indian nationals and support to the Taiwanese uh, uh, investors and traders. On economic front and cultural front, India and Taiwan are very closely engaged. Uh, world's largest connector company, which is known as Foxconn uh, uh, internationally, or uh, 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 there is another name in Chinese, I'm, it's just, I'm just forgetting. So that was set up in India way back in 2004. And it was the world's largest uh, connector making company, uh, manufacturer. Uh, today, they supply almost all the connectors to iPhone. Uh, so it's it's quite big. Uh, other than that, there are close, close to another 250 investors from Taiwan to India. 
uh, who are doing that. Similarly, there are Indian investments in Taiwan, uh, student exchanges, academic, academic exchanges, Indian fashion shows are hosted in Taiwan, sari splendor of Indian sari is being hosted in Taiwan. So all kinds of normal, non-political, non-military uh, diplomatic uh, relations are uh, uh, there, and it is in full public note. Uh, on the uh, role for Canada in the Indo-Pacific, huge. Canada brings with it uh, itself uh, a huge capacity, which it had been able to develop through the growth and development of its own economy, its own multiculturalism, its own tolerance, its own democracy. So all these uh, values are extremely valuable to be shared with the Indo-Pacific region. So therefore, Canada brings value addition to the table. Uh, the challenges which were earlier asked uh, by, uh, by the moderator, while it is okay to go alone, but uh, largely it's a regional policy. So any country which is coming on to the Indo-Pacific region uh, would, should be well aware that unless we are able to get countries sit around the table, our initiatives will just remain a bilateral initiative with the country concerned. Uh, and so that, that's that's a, that's a challenge uh, which one faces. Uh, we faced this challenge when we when we were a dialogue partner with ASEAN. It was not very easy to to uh, have a dialogue with ASEAN as a group. But when we became full dialogue partner, it became so much easier. And then we will be we were able to take collective views. We were able to do collective meetings. We'll do the workshops in India. We'll go and attend ASEAN workshops there. So all these things were happening, and that uh, reduced the impediment level uh, for us. Uh, on China, uh, I mean, you are very fortunate to be so far away. You only face the diaspora-related issues. You only face the trade and investment-related issues. And occasionally, a couple of balloons will fly into your airspace. Uh, we face it day in and day out. Not only all these, but add on that the military. Add, add on that other strategic uh, uh, circumvention of uh, India's geography. So a lot of things happen there. And therefore, of course, we have a much more robust uh, uh, demand from China. And uh, we have much more robust approach towards dealing with China. We have fought a war with China. We, I'm sure the audience would know that. So what? Uh, and at the same time, we are engaged with them very closely in BRICS and SCO. SEO is a strategic organization. BRICS, you can say that there are multiple tracks there. So we engage with them. Uh, so what we did after the last uh, misadventure of China on India's northern border, uh, uh, today, generally speaking, China, even through its investment and trade, is not welcome in India. There is, is not business as usual with China. All the issues are in one basket, so therefore, it cannot be that we can keep fighting with you, but we'll do trade. We'll keep fighting with you, but we'll do uh, uh, collaborative uh, uh, innovation. These, these things are completely in one basket. Unless the entire basket gets attention that it deserves, we don't move forward on any other element. So more or less, it's a frozen relationship at the moment, uh, uh, whatever could normally be done through WTO mechanism, WHO mechanism, UN mechanism, those things will go on, of course, or BRICS mechanism or SEO mechanisms, those things will go on. But bilaterally, the contact is too a minimal, uh, 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 though both of us have got big diplomatic presence in each other's countries. Uh, so I think these were the questions. Thank you very much, um, Your Excellency. And uh, Nan Tandan has a question. Uh, is there anyone else uh, in the audience? Stephen, do you see anyone else with their hand up? Um, and there, are there any questions in the chat, Stephen? OK. Uh, Nan? Thank you, Ravi. Excellent presentations by both the speakers. Uh, I have a question and a comment. My question is, um, does Indo-Pacific mean Asia-Pacific Pacific plus India, or does it include other countries also, like 
Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. Uh, my comment is that, I don't know how to say it, India-Canada relations, bilateral relationship right now is less than smooth. Uh, the National Security Advisor of Canada has lumped India along with Russia, China and Iran as countries interfering in Canada's domestic politics. The External Affairs Minister of India has retorted by accusing none other than Prime Minister Trudeau of interfering in Can India's domestic affairs when he supported farmers' movement in India. Uh, the political party, which is right now a partner in the government, has asked Canada to down downgrade its relationship with India because of India's human rights record. India, on the other hand, is uh, accusing Canada of turning a, by, uh, turning a blind eye to anti-Indian activities taking place on Indian soil. My comment is that the, if the Indo-Pacific strategy is going to be effective optimally, then these two, the bilateral relationship should, uh, should be, uh, the issues should be addressed to mitigate uh, these kind of irritants. Thank you. Uh, would, uh, would our guest speakers uh, like to comment on that? And, and also, uh, Professor Naogi, perhaps you can quickly ask your question. And we are running out of time soon. So uh, one, perhaps one last question from Professor Prabir Naogi, Carleton University. Uh, Rui, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My question builds on Nanth Tandon's question. Those of us who are old enough to remember the Nehruvian times, remember that the relationship in the first 10 years after 1947 between India and Canada were extremely close, that Pandit Nehru and Louis Saint Laurent worked out the arrangement which allowed India to remain in the Commonwealth but as a republic, and that India and Canada both served on the interstate, uh, on the international uh, ICCC for Vietnam. That's just by way of an example. My point is that until the bilateral relationship between India and Canada is improved, and it's both nations, particularly Canada, see it in their strategic interest to improve this relationship, to what extent are we just only talking? Well, uh, thank you very much for your questions, uh, uh, Dr. Neogi and, and Nan Tandan. Um, we can always count on our professors to ask the challenging questions. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Christian and, and Your Excellency, if you wouldn't mind responding, uh, uh, we'd like to hear your views. So, uh, Your Excellency, maybe I, I'll go first on this one, uh, unless you, you have objections? No objections at all. Please carry on, sir. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, as a former academic, I used to be a lecturer before during the Foreign Service. I, I'm, I'm happy that the professors are leading the way and asking the tough questions because as they should, as they should. So uh, I, I'll just preface by saying that, um, you know, I'm not the official who's in charge of bilateral relations with India. So I, I do the regional piece, but I, uh, given the events of the recent days, obviously, I did have a chat with them before coming in uh, to make sure I was up, uh, up to speed on, on the latest developments. Now, all I can say, I can't speak on behalf of the National Security and Intelligence advisor for whom I used to work when I was at the Privy Council, incidentally. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, the Canada-India bilateral relationship is is a lot more complex than it was, you know, in 1947 afterwards. You know, we have uh, a lot of competing interests. We have a large Indian, uh, can, well, that uh, Canadian diaspora here of Indian descent, many who have views about what's going on in India. And, uh, you know, they have, they're free to express uh, their views. Uh, sometimes they go a bit too far, as we we saw this week, and uh, you know we've uh, uh, our high commissioner commented on that. All I can say is, 
you know, the, there have been ups and downs in the bilateral relationship. I mentioned that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Modi met on the margins of G7 summit uh, last year. I think it was the first bilateral meeting in, in a few years. But uh, I think that uh, if we focus on uh, the areas of substantive progress, there are a lot of uh, shared interests that we have. We have made progress discussing trade, discussing uh, cooperation on, on environment, and increasingly security cooperation in recent months. And uh, because we have a, a complex uh, relationship, there are gonna be ups and downs, but I'm, uh, I'm personally confident that we have the structures in place to be able to keep things in a positive momentum. But uh, you know, the reality is there are many elements in society who will have views about what's going on in India, but you know, our, our job as officials, and I think our ministers are committed to this, is to keep having respect, a respectful and frank dialogue with India and to continue taking the relationship to the next level. I'll leave it at that for now, uh, and I'll turn to the, His Excellency, the High Commissioner. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Louis. Uh, so first of all, definition of Indo-Pacific from our perspective, all littoral countries uh, uh, which are on the Indian Ocean Rim or Pacific Ocean Rim are countries of Indo-Pacific region. So basically it goes up to the southern tip of Africa on one side and the entire Pacific on the other side. Uh, so Bangladesh, as you mentioned by name, is very much a part of uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Indo region. Uh, on the comments from NSIA, uh, I don't know the context, uh, I wasn't there in that uh, meeting. It's a bit difficult for me to say so, uh, but given the partnership that, uh, and we have a strategic partnership, given the partnership that we have, uh, it will always be wiser to first uh, take such issues uh, uh, within the defined government to government channels uh, so that uh, uh, things are discussed uh, uh, at uh, the uh, levels which it needs to get, to get the attention. Uh, but I'll just stop there. Uh, NSIA is a very senior functionary of the government. And uh, if what she said uh, has been quoted uh, uh, appropriately, uh, well, that's, that's for Canada to respond to. Uh, I'll not be able to add any much value to that. Uh, but as far as we are concerned, uh, we do see a few uh, 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 Canadians who, who are also Indo-Canadians, uh, the Canadians of Indian heritage or Indian origin. They do try to create fishes. And either they themselves are creating fishes or they are getting support from outside as well to create fishes, all these could be uh, debated uh, uh, for a long time, but the result is that there are fishes and these need to be filled in. So uh, unless uh, another question which was asked right in the beginning, now that relates to this particular response. We need to improve literacy about each other. If the domestic uh, policy making and domestic relations is same to the international behavior of a country, then we need not discuss these issues at all. So as soon as one leaves the borders, one needs to respect the culture, the society, where one is uh, able to connect uh, with himself or herself. And it, uh, uh, India being the largest democracy in the world, India does understand the value of freedom of expression. But when the freedom of expression becomes disruptive, as we have seen in the recent past. Uh, it is something where we will feel quite uh, uh, concerned. To give you an example to this audience, on the 4th of uh, June in Brampton, there was a procession which was taken out. And in on one of the truck trailers, there was a depiction of assassination of India's former prime minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, in gory details. Now, which civilized society will accept such hateful incitements in public? And therefore, we got the response from our Canadian interlocutors, and very correctly, 
there is no place of this kind of a hate in Canada. So that is something uh, uh, which is there. But yes, there is a small handful number of people. I will put put that number to about ten thousand uh, who are also able to intimidate others so that their tribe grows uh, and uh, they are they are uh, creating uh, difficult situations for people like us and uh, Mr. Deroche sitting there uh, uh, to make uh, make things work as usual. So I will not go away from accepting that there, yes, there are issues due to insensitivity about the culture that one is trying to launch. Any issue, again, coming on the uh, anti-India uh, uh, activities in Canada, any issue which goes beyond the borders, till the time it is uh, within the borders, we have no comments to offer. That's completely internal domestic affairs of Canada. It can do whatever it wishes to. But when it spills over to international borders, as far as India, and there are various mechanisms, which I will not be able to discuss in this forum, through which these influences and impacts to uh, India, then we have a concern. So there we will not just call it domestic internal Canadian affairs, but it has impact on India and therefore will raise our concerns. But all these concerns will be raised through the normal uh, channels of contact between the two governments. And we, I will not to the media or any other informal group uh, uh, taking them out. So uh, concerns are there. Please rest assured that all of them do get uh, attention that they deserve. Uh, sometimes we do not see the convergence. As I told you that we have a strategic autonomy for India, and similarly, there is strategic autonomy for Canada. So many a times we will not see eye to eye on that, but we do converge on the overall architecture of our relations uh, to move forward. Uh, on, many a times what I have seen that there is a general generalization of our relationship through the diaspora. That is detrimental for the future. We should always look beyond the diaspora. We should always look at the issues where if the diaspora can get involved, if the diaspora can become a bridge, why not? But let's not count out those issues where diaspora is not involved. There could be many such issues. HADR, for example. Uh, so uh, so th therefore, there are issues where we converge. There are some issues where we will seek more convergence over the period of time. Uh, we will try to educate those uh, uh, in the society here who call themselves, very few of them again, who call themselves Indo-Canadians and harming India and Canada both. So we will need to somehow take care of that and take out this irritant from our bilateral relation. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you to both our um, uh, guest speakers and uh, very eloquently uh, shared with us um, uh, each of your views. Uh, I think I'd just like to add that on the, the positive front, um, there are many organizations such as the India Canada Friendship Circle and uh, the Indo-Canadian Cult uh, Cultural Centers here today as well. And we also partner with the Royal Commonwealth Society here in Ottawa, as well as the Canada India Education Council based in Toronto. And there's so many organizations that um, are working on um, uh, joint science and technology uh, initiatives under the Canada India mm -hmm. ST agreement. Um, we have nuclear cooperation. We have, you know, for civil society or for civil uh, use and peaceful purposes. Uh, um, and and Christian, uh, you know, Mr. Dadosh spoke about uh, the environment MOU that we recently renewed. And there's so many areas um, that uh, we have uh, a common um, interest uh, in which we can harness that potential. Uh, working in partnership, not only between the governments, but at all levels, not only at the state level in India, but with their provinces and territories, but um, track two, track three, uh, you know, with, with uh, organizations such as ourselves. So I think that would contribute to the literacy that uh, uh, Christian was speaking of 
uh, whether it's uh, enhancing trade and investment or um, cultural and historic uh, knowledge and, and uh, expertise. And uh, uh, I think Dr. La Liberté, uh, I look forward to uh, reading, uh, I guess, the chapter of the book uh, that, that you're working on. Um, you know, we, we need not reinvent the wheel, as they say. Many of us have been working um, in this area for many, many years um, in our various uh, capacities. So um, I think it's a matter of uh, 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 partnership and uh, uh, joining hands and uh, drowning out the negatives. So, <laughs> so I hope uh, on a, we can end this on a positive note. And, um, uh, you know, we, also, in, in the uh, era of social media, <laughs> um, in so many ways, governments don't have control. Um, and now we have artificial intelligence coming our way. So there are many other challenges um, that uh, perhaps we can have another forum to discuss to discuss that, uh, emerging technologies. So once again, thank you to everyone for your, um, for your active and enthusiastic participation. Uh, we always learn from each other uh, at the India-Canada Friendship Circle. And I would like to uh, turn this over uh, to Dr. Stephen Desjardins, um, who is a professor of mathematics at Ottawa U uh, and a vice president for the vote of thanks. Uh, and very quickly, uh, is uh, Ms. Dogra here? Ms. Dogra uh, or uh, Ken Talwar? Uh, okay, just they wanted us to announce that the Indo-Canadian Community Centre has established um, a youth scholarships program, and uh, they will be the scholarships will be awarded to undergraduate students currently enrolled in degree programs at Ottawa post-secondary institutions in the amount of one thousand dollars each. So the application deadline is August fifth um, of this year. And uh, you can contact us uh, and, and we can help you uh, in, in terms of applying to, to that program. Um, Stephen, I'd like to turn to you for the vote of thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think um, the takeaways uh, from this evening's uh, presentations, uh, which were both wonderful, very informative, is that uh, we got the opportunity to see some of the detail right, to get into the detail of, you know, what is uh, Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, and also a bit of the detail of what's India's Indo-Pacific vision. And it allows us then to sort of look forward to implementation of these policies that will help both nations um, separately, but also together. Because there are, of course, uh, many areas where Canada and India do have overlapping interest. Um, and the Indo-Pacific region as a whole, of course, is obviously one of those great areas. So I would like to thank His Excellency and uh, Mr. Darush uh, for their absolutely wonderful, informative presentations. Uh, thank you both for being with us here this evening. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Nipa Banerjee for uh, uh, acting as our moderator this evening and her insightful comments as well. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, who joined us uh, in the audience. Uh, we are uh, very happy to be uh, getting together again uh, to uh, have our events. And we look forward to uh, seeing uh, people hopefully in person in the not, not so far future. So once again, thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you to uh, Nipa. Uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you very thank much, you, Stephen. Steve. Thank you, Dr. Energy and uh, Christian, Your Excellency, and uh, High Commissioner Verma, uh, and to our wonderful audience. So do keep in touch. And uh, we are a friendship circle, so uh, we encourage everyone to uh, meet new people and to network and, and also to renew old friendships. So we'll keep the lines open after this. The recording will be turned off and uh, um, please, uh, we can't offer tea and snacks, but uh, we can offer you our lines um, to stay and socialize. So hopefully we'll, you know, we uh, will return to our tasty Indian snacks uh, in the fall. So thank you once again. and.